Welcome back, everyone. <laughs> From wherever you went just then, welcome back. How good was Michael and Jess this afternoon? Awesome. That was amazing. You don't know what you've got in your own town, yeah? Some of the world leaders. Yeah. They're here. They're just outside in the lobby, so you can thank them and congratulate them. Is Mike okay? Great. Okay. Fantastic. All right. Can we roll the movie, Mr. Movie Man? The law? <laughs> if you want to support those guys, you can uh, support them. They're a non-profit that do all that stuff. They put it out for free. They don't charge you. So that's quite amazing. Okay. Welcome back. How are we all? Good? Mike and Jesse here. Dr. Dre's here. There's a Jenga set there. You ready? You fired up? In, in, about, in about five minutes. It's a giant one on the table behind you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So first of all, quick let's bring up Galatians uh, 3, 18 to 19. We are really laying down the foundation of understanding. What I'm presenting to you is not new. Everybody knew it. Everything I said you can find on the internet, in books, at a Bible college, in the teaching of the early fathers, in the Bible, and Enoch, and Jasher, and Jubilees, it's, uh, and in all the surrounding cultures. And the only difference is they saw this intervention of these gods as great, and, uh, but they knew they were judged, because they obviously they got judged, and the Jews saying, it's not great, and we're trying to, God is trying to protect, protect, protect from Eve a genetic line that can hold the seed of the Messiah, yeah, okay, and here's a verse I said yesterday, I just want to clarify something, Galatians 3, 18 to 19, maybe I'll For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by a promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. I'll make a point there. Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? Why was the law added? It was added because of transgressions. Okay. Interbreeding, intermixing, hovering over, and worse stuff. Until the offspring should come. So it's obviously to protect the DNA line. The law's there to protect from transgressions until a certain offspring, of, offspring has come. To whom the promise had been made, it was put in place through angels by the intermediary. Okay. First of all, that's in the context of Abraham. Abraham received a promise okay, of the seed. But I was going by on that to say, and, not but Eve, and Eve, by the law of first mention, was the first one promised that seed. Just to clarify, so everyone thinks... From yesterday, that that's not about Abraham. It certainly is about Abraham. But the law of first mention, I was saying, and Eve. I'm restoring that fact, okay? Because we see that Mary restores Eve. Can you put that photo up of Mary and Eve, please? This is one of my favorite all-time pieces of art. I love art, and this is my favorite, one of my favorites. It's one of the greatest stories in the Bible. You don't understand seed, and you don't understand what happened. You don't understand God's love and compassion for Eve, and the devil's hatred for Eve, and the shame of Eve being restored by Mary. Because Eve didn't believe the word. Yeah. And what did Mary say? Be it unto me as according to your word. You see, Mary's heel is bruising the serpent. Yeah, complete restoration. 
guilt, I've done something wrong. Shame, there's something wrong about me. Mary restores that. Who was the first person to hear about the Messiah? Eve. Who was the second person <laughs> to hear that the actual Messiah was coming? Mary. Yeah. Who was the first person to see the risen Christ? Mary. Always a female. Always a female. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, you can just Google that picture. It's famous. Just write Mary and Eve picture in Google. Put it on your wall. It's uh, compassion. Speaking of compassionate, powerful females, Drea is here. Dr. Drea. Yay. Yeah. We'd like to welcome her up. So we were talking yesterday about Rafa. Jehovah Rafa is uh, God is my healer. Yeah. We've got giant DNA or bad DNA, that's why they think about it, in us. You take the giant to heal the land. This is your land. And uh, the giants are our bread. And if you take uh, healing is the children's bread. You can see as you remove this, you get healed. You become more efficient, you become more healthy. And basically, you've got less agreement with death and more agreement with life. Yep. As you do all these things. So all the things you had learned in Sunday school. I forgive everyone. We love. <laughs> Sing the songs. But from your heart. Okay, and that's a gift. That heart is in you already. As we saw, the law has been put in you now. Yeah, you, your nature is to forgive. That's your nature, to forgive. Your, nat- your true nature is your Father's true nature, to bless those who curse you, to pray for enemies. And as that goes from your spirit into your soul, you choose it. And if you can't choose it, you choose to choose it. <laughs> You're willing to be made willing. And finally, it hits your body and it changes the frequency set of your body, okay, of a loving father as opposed to uh, a murderous father. You're displaying the nature of your true father. That is the transfigure. That is the change of your body. Yep, that's what you want. Yep, okay. So, uh, Dr. Drea is here and uh, she has an uh, amazing understanding of many things about how emotions connect to the physiology of the body and also uh, of neural networks and understanding. I really don't. Can we pull up the neural picture, please? The picture says neural. I don't know what that is. The dinosaur. <laughs> I don't know who does. Yeah, you just talk there. Yeah, you know. I do. Hi. Um, Hi. I just want to say I'm incredibly happy to be here with all of you. Thank you for joining us on this journey and being in this space here. So this is, yes, there's actually a, quite a few different pieces on there. I don't know if you can read a lot of these things, but so you have a couple different parts. You have the body which is the round part, and you have like the legs. Then you have what's called um, myelin sheath. And I I think um, Kirby talked a little bit about this, and so this is gonna be a little bit of review. But I think this is so beautiful because um, I look at the nervous system and the body and biology, and I feel like I can see the universe. Like like when we're looking at the stars, I feel like we're looking at this mirror of of this whole nervous system. There's a picture I found um, online of the nervous system and how extensive it is. And you know, they, in, in my field, we talk about the nervous system as there's the skull-based portion of the nervous system, which is your brain, and then there's the rest of it that goes throughout the body. And so everywhere throughout your body, this is on the super, super small scale. This is all over the place. In fact, um, I think in the brain, the last I read, was that there are over 200 million miles long, just in the skull base portion of these guys all connected. And they connect through these little terminal buttons at the bottom. And they connect sometimes to the body, sometimes to the other dendrites, different things. So it's, it's a really beautiful, beautiful process. Um, 
going back to what Kirby had talked about with thoughts and um, and I I personally looking at looking at the research and looking at people's lived experiences, I think I would I think even here today it feels like words start sometimes with our thoughts. They're not just what comes out of your mouth. And so long before anything comes out of your mouth, there's a whole world that's being created on the inside of you. And then you start saying it and then you start living it. And sometimes it's the other way around. So we talk about movement, right? So if we're moving, then that's, it's like this, in, in my field we talk about afferent and efferent. So it's a two-way communication. It's from the inside out and then from the outside in. It's from the bottom up, it's from the top down. What's um, so important about all of these things is that when we have a thought that comes through, which as we know, you get lots of thoughts throughout the day, um, they, they build something. Um, and I like to do this with Jenga, so I'm just gonna set this down for a second to, to illustrate what this looks like. So when, imagine that each one of these is a neuron and they're connecting to each other. So I'll let you have the, oh, you can't see anymore. Is it possible to put that back up there? Because I'm gonna re refer to the, back to this all the time. So imagine that this right here is the end, so you have like a terminal button and it's connecting either to a body or another terminal button and they're just going down. So there's a bunch of different kinds of um, neurons or neural substances that are inside the brain. And one of them that you'll see up here um, is those myelin sheath, which is actually a part of a, a set that's, they're not neurons, but they're a substance that does a lot for, for neurons. Um, but they're called glial cells. And there's three different types or four different types. But basically, what they do is they, they make sure that messages go along across them and then in the terminal button here, so once it gets down to the end, it says something and then it hits the bottom of it and then it sends out a message like a hormone, so like serotonin or cor you know, cortisol, whatever, however you want to talk about it, that's not one, but, um, and then it hits this side and then it goes down. Now each one is fed um, like through these myelin sheath, which is um, a form of glial cells. So, you, you know, and kind of like Kirby had talked about, you can have very, very weak, fragmented ones. Um, different diseases will break them down and make it really challenging for um, electrical currents to go across. And, but there's also ways that you can build it up and make it stronger so it can move much faster. When you have a thought that flows through your brain, it's kind of like, so, so imagine that this one is one that maybe uh, one belief that you've had like your whole life, maybe that you learned from your parents. I'm a black sheep. So let's say this represents this belief that I, I, I believe this whole, I'm a black sheep. So when we have these, you know, 70,000 thoughts a day, many of them are what, what's called ruminative. So they're happening over and over and over. When that happens um, and they travels along, it just keeps on growing. And so we end up having what's called neural bundles. And they, get, they can get really big. And so the more often we travel them, the bigger they get, the stronger they become. And some of them are like freeways. So we like get on these things and there's no exit, right? You ever had that happen where like you have a thought and you just cannot get off the highway? It just keeps on going. So they're really intense. Well. So what would be something, if you were to think about, what would Jesus say to you about that thought? I mean, what's his opinion on it? Okay, so now you're created in my image. So this happens once. So I don't know if you can see this. If I was out there, I would not be able to see it because I don't have my glasses on. But this is a strand of my hair. So that thought, the first time you hear it, is relatively in size. So as you begin to think about things, as you begin to 
play with them, imagine them, you can um, watch them grow. And some of the ways that we help thoughts grow is through emotion. Um, research shows that the more strongly emotionally activated you are at the time of an event, um, these types of neural bundles get made very quickly, like in an instant. And so when you go back to remembering something, it's very easy to get there because it was stored in a spot that's particular to a strong emotion. So strong emotions might be like anger, they might be fear, um, it also could be joy or ecstasy, whatever. So um, what's so great about glial cells that I love them so much, they're like my favorite ones. Like if you have a favorite star, mine is the glial cell. Um, so basically it makes them thicker and stronger and makes them move quicker and gets you on them and then you can run down them. So imagine what would happen if you were to have like a really wonderful thought, the most amazing thought you've ever had that someone maybe said to you that maybe you learned from a long time ago. You're talented, okay? So, I'm not gonna lie, I got a little distracted and forgot where I was going. So, okay, so let's say you have that, that thought. It's, it's harder for someone to come up to you or someone to throw a thought at you or you to see something and for you to get jumped, bumped off that because it's something that's been in there for so long. So it's the same thing, whether it's positive or negative. Okay, so let's say you're like, okay, so I want to change a thought. People are, and what's horrible is you get on this freeway and then you're just burdened and miserable and tormented and it's awful. So then a therapist comes in and says, oh, actually it's better that you live and you are a great person who should be alive and I'd be really sad if you died but I'm throwing out a hair, a piece of hair. I mean, that's not even a lifeline. That wouldn't even lift you up out of the water. And so what's so cool about glial cells is that they have so many different functions. But the thing that I love about them most is that they sort of, they, to me, they're like glue. They sort of just like hold things together. They, they, they're also this nourishment. They feed. Um, different neurons, they are also like, there's ones that like clean, they're like little cleaners, they like run around. Um, they're just really amazing, they serve so many functions. But what ends up happening is, is that, so this is a freeway, right? So I have this new thought that's a little piece of hair that's not gonna help anybody, so you think. Um, but what ends up happening is, is if I will stop and get off this highway and stop jumping this highway all the time, and I jump to this other hair, as precarious as it might be, um, I'm no longer on this. And what ends up happening is, is that the brain tells the glial cells that there's a highway that's like not being used and it's like not useful. And so it's kind of just taking up space. So what ends up happening is, is that the more that you stick with this new one and travel down this, it does the same thing. It begins to grow. So then you have this one that's kind of, you know, imagine that it's right next to each other. They're probably not typically actually next to each other. What ends up happening is, is the glial cells go in there and they eat them. They like tear it down. And then they use it to myelinate the new ones. Yeah, so that's a really interesting process. But in like real life, what that looks like sometimes is quite a strong internal battle and quite strong emotional experience which can be really devastating. And so, I don't really know where to go from here. Oh, yeah, yeah. So anytime, I, I love, I had this professor once who said something that I just think is so powerful, but he said, every choice entails loss. And so as you are letting go of an old thought, which our thoughts kind of make up our identity, right? So like what we think is kind of who we become. And so, like, we have this identity that is, I believe these things about myself, and all of a sudden, oh, now I don't. Well, there's a lot of grief in that. It's hard to let go of something that we felt so comfortable in and that made sense and that probably connected us to other people and connected us maybe to our families or made, connected us to all sorts of things. But now you have this transition, and the transition is painful, and it's hard. Um, Answer the question. 
Well, yeah, so the, the myelin sheath is kind of what does that. So what happens is, is so the, the glial cells, they eat this one, and then they come over here, and then they myelinate, which creates the, elect the electrical current gets stronger and faster. And so you'll actually have, like, if you were to watch it on, like, a actual microscope, you would see, like, electricity. I think you upset the titans. <laughs> Thank you very much. So you can see that uh, the giants are your bread. You get rid of one thought and it becomes the health and the platform of the new thought. Like autophagy, yeah? You take apart the unuseful cells and you make life. That's immortality swelling up mortality. So that's amazing. Thank you, Drea. That was very good. And also know that there's a grief, there's a loss, okay? Uh, because uh, it's part of your identity, which you're losing, and you had that identity, it served a purpose. Even if you're a victim, that was that thinking, well, it's good to be a victim. Because nothing's expected of you. And everybody feels sorry for you. And um, why would you ever leave that? And now there's a reason why your life is the way it is. You know, the victim, now the only reason life is the way it is is because of you. <laughs> okay, these are difficult things to process and sometimes you subconsciously uh, undermine yourself for the, from these things. Yeah, and that's the, the grief. Yeah, and the other grief is when you hear something new, I've switched to this microphone, thank you very much. <laughs> when, um, when you hear something new and you hear a new truth, you realise the cost of the old truth. And that is a grief. 20 years in that cult, 20 years thinking I was less than 20 years of, I think, I lost my first business over that thought. I lost my first marriage over that thought. I lost, you know, my health over that thought. But it's worth it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So what are we doing from now until the end, next, next few nights? I've uh, separated it into four parts. First one is called Yahweh Picks a Fight. Second one's called Jesus Picks a Fight. Third one's called Disciples Pick a Fight. And last is called Saints Pick a Fight. Okay. The gates of hell will not withstand. Everyone's scared of the Antichrist. What on earth is that about? All right. Remember, you know, the great morning star who ascended, and they looked at him and said, is this the troubler of the saints? It's written there for us. Okay. So first of all, I just want to show you, in the Old Testament, okay, how God picked a fight. He always wanted to pick a fight. He is Yahweh of Yahweh. Oh no, sorry, Elohim of Elohim. <laughs> he's, he's Lord of Lords. Okay, God of Gods, Lord Most High. Amongst the divine council, if you don't understand there's a divine council and what's going on, you don't understand why they do the things they do in the Bible. You don't understand this fallen council has messed up human DNA and they want our DNA to be messed up. So they don't want the Messiah and they don't want manifest sons because manifest sons is the end for them. Okay? Yep. And they're fighting for it and they want our emotions so they can express themselves. And as we'll see today, or probably tomorrow, we'll see that it is the nature you express that is your father. That's how Jesus ex talks about it. You're expressing the nature of a murderer now. So Satan is your father. You're not of me. You're not my sheep. Okay? Satan's your father. He's very clear on this. Okay? It's that record in you. A different frequency set, what you agree to, what you believe, how you react, what triggers you. Okay? And we're learning to overcome these things. And you inherited, you're a beautiful spirit being, perfect. You've inherited this DNA. Now some of your DNA, back to 10 generations, <laughs> says God is a bad father. Yahweh is a bad father. You, father, you did this to me. That's Adam's first reaction. He's now expressing the nature of Satan, who was 
one of those beings that fell the first one. And, uh, and he turns in wrath and he's, he wants to murder God. Yeah, he hates God. He's a murderer, and a liar, and a thief. And that's what that nature is. And fortunately, <laughs> fortunately, is that the right word for term to use? <laughs> With wisdom and grace <laughs> and all understanding to God's great delight before the foundation of the world, he decided to make you holy and blameless in his sight. Why? So you could have a family to govern with, like the Bible started with, all through the Old Testament, and now, and in the book of Revelation, right through. Yeah, that's what he wants, to govern with his family. So, the problem is, the five falls of Genesis 1 to 11. That's the problem, okay? And then, so Genesis 12, God starts to fix up this problem. And as we saw, Genesis 12 was in the body, it's a flesh war, so to speak. And then the New Testament is a spiritual war. In Genesis 12, we won't have to go there. I'll just read these out. There's a lot of assumed knowledge here. I assume you know who Abraham is and some of that story. If you're new to the Bible, uh, please forgive me. So Abraham, what's the first thing God did to Abraham? He took him out of his land. Remember, gods have land. And this guy who served the God of that land, a full-on Elohim, well, maybe not, but an Elohim, certainly, was moving to another land. So what is God doing? He's picking a fight. And you'll see this over and over again. Old Testament, Jesus did it, the disciples did it, they went out into other lands. Paul walks into Ephesus, where Artemis is. What's he doing? He's picking a fight. Abraham's dad, Terah, can we put up Joshua 24-2? So Abraham goes around, what happens? He has to kill kings. <laughs> Fights happen. He starts wiping out, look at the name of those kings, you find things out about them. Look at their family lines, you find out stuff about them, okay? And uh, I'll show you uh, his dad first in uh, Joshua 24-2. I might be frozen. Okay, they'll work it out. Tell me when it gets there. And what, what was the promise to Abraham? He'd be a blessing to all nations. So what's God doing here? He's fixing this up. He's addressing 1 to 11 straight away. And what does Abraham have? A child. What type of child? A natural child? A child of a promise. God's putting faith, a record of faith in us, okay? He's starting something new, okay, to fix up the situation here. Uh, Joshua 24.2. Great. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago, your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham, and Nahor, and of Nahor, and they served other gods. Okay? So God, there's all these people, they all serve other gods, the Elohim that put over people, over land, we saw in Deuteronomy 32, 7 and 8. And God's decided, I'm going to choose a people now. All you Elohim, you've had your shot. I am going to choose a people. He chose Abraham, who served other Elohim. He came and said, leave your family and leave your land and just listen to my voice. Will you believe my word? That's how you start a new line. Receiving a seed, a word. Yep. Okay. So God picks a fight. Well, let's show you something very interesting about this dynamic. It's very consistent. Can we put up Genesis 15, 16? So there's all these people around, and they've traded and traded and traded, and God's merciful, 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 but they get more corrupt, more corrupt, more corrupt, until they're wicked all the time, and it's cruel on the next generation of children, and the children and children, it's becoming so corrupt, God needs to remove it. 
okay? For mercy, for love. So Genesis 15, 6. Ah, that is the wrong reference. <laughs> Sin isn't full. Right. Oh, 15, oh, 15, 16. Yes, thank you, everyone. Good work, team. Takes a village to raise this child. Okay. And so uh, Abraham's going around. He's taking out people that God says to take out because of the crimes they've committed with the Elohim and the crimes are committed against fish, <laughs> reptiles, and animals, and children. You get it. Okay. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Okay? They're wiping out people, wipe it out, wipe it out, wipe it out. And there's Amorites, we saw yesterday they were giants, and God says, no, their sin isn't full yet. Fascinating, yeah? He's patient, patient, patient until there's a place when in his mind he judges. How's he judges? The other watchers come up and say, look what our former brothers <laughs> are doing. Okay? And here he's saying, not yet. Their sin's not full. If you go to Deuteronomy 20, 17, it's about the Amorites. The Amorites were giants. Yep. Their sin's not full. But you shall devote them to complete to but you shall devote them to complete destruction. The Hittite and the Amorites, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the Hittites and the Jebusites, as the Lord God has commanded. Okay. So, four generations later, <laughs> or many, genera many generations later, the Amorites, their sin is full. Time's up. And that's what God's doing. And this is what God's doing on the earth right now. The wheat must grow up with the weeds, with the tear and the wheat. I'm going to use the King James. And not till it's full. When it's full, he'll rip it out. Yep. We're saying, God, why aren't you judging these things? It's very hard to see why that God doesn't just come down and just smash it all. But he must be faithful. He must be just. And he's giving time to repent. Remember Jezebel <laughs> in uh, our Revelation? She's done a lot of naughty stuff. She's done this and this and this. And as you can tell, it must have taken a few years to get all that done because there's children involved. And Jesus says, I've given her time to repent. He's very patient. More patient than I am. That's for sure. Oh, more patient than my current DNA set is, but not more patient than my true self, which is divinely patient. <laughs> that was a test. Okay. And so you see, all of Joshua 10, they're going around and knocking out these people. Yeah. We can bring up, what should we do? Numbers 33. No, we'll do Egypt. All right. Don't worry about it. So God's picking fights. What does he tell Abraham? Your descendants are going to go into Egypt. Why is that? Who's the biggest, strongest, proudest, most powerful Elohim on the earth right now? The Egyptian gods. Yep. So he's going to take his people and put them right in there. Imagine being the Egyptian gods when you saw Elohim's people come in and stand in your land. Well, it would have been a very interesting, tense moment, I feel. Yep. So God puts Israel in Egypt. He's picking a fight. Okay? And his people are going to do it. And then God takes them out. Each plague is a rebuke to an individual God of Egypt, individual Elohim. Okay? So Hopi, the water bearer, God turns the Nile to blood. Hecate has a frog head, frog head. Yep. So, plague of frogs. And you will see earlier on, I should have written this down, but the magicians match God early. Yep. Match, match, yep. Snakes and snakes. Yep, we can do that. I can do that. All right. But God's snakes ate their snakes, okay? And earlier on, the magicians could do everything that God was doing. And then they got to a point where they got outclassed. And then it just went on and on and on and on and on. It's interesting. Okay? Heck, uh, Geb was the god of dust. And it says lice 
from dust. Yep. Kepri, head of a fly, it's a form of flies. Hathor had the head of a cow. That's a cow god. Probably literally had the head of a cow. Some fallen, you saw the, the cherubim, all those things up there. Okay. And then all the cows and cattle got killed with the plague. Isis with medicine and boils and sores and everybody. Nut, the goddess of the sky, then hail comes down from the sky. And, uh, and then when the hail came down, they said, there's none like him in the earth. Who? Elohim, our Elohim. Seth, storm clouds, and there's, uh, clouds of locusts came. Ra, the sun god, okay, against the big gods now. They're, they're, they're top tier gods. And was it? Darkness. And last of all, Pharaoh, who's the son of Ra, and God struck down his firstborn. Yep. And from that, created the Passover, which brought in the Messiah. So you can see what God's doing. Go on the people and the land. We have Numbers 33, 51 to 53. Up. Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you pass over the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their figured stones and destroy all their metal images, demolish all their high places. What? Places of training. Idols, overshadowing, DNA. And you shall take possession of the land and settle in it, for I have given you the land to possess. That's exactly what God's doing. He took them to Egypt first, knocked out the big one, okay? And what happens after that? All the Elohim know. They're on notice. They all know. Lord Most High has a people. He just took out Ra. They know who Ra is. They've known who Ra is for millions and millions of years. And now they know. They are going to get it. Yep. If you put up uh, Joshua 2, 9 to 12. And said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land. Oh, this is Rahab. This is Rahab the spy who belongs to another Elohim. Yep. Okay. And she's talking to some Israelite spies. This is Rahab the prostitute talking to Israelite spies. Yep. I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen on us and all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. We have heard what the Lord dried, we heard we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites giants who were beyond the Jordan to Shiho and Og with a big bed remember Og's big bed <laughs> whom you devoted to destruction and as soon as we heard it our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you for the Lord your God he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath now then please swear to me by the Lord as I have dealt kindly to you you also will deal kindly with me in my father's house and give me a sure sign what she's saying, we've heard, you, brought, you beat Ra, okay, you beat the Egyptian gods, and you killed the giants. You've knocked them all out. We've melted like wax. And then she says, your Lord is the high Lord. So she's coming under another covering. By our confession, she's received a word. So what happens to Rahab? She's in the lineage of Christ. Mixed DNA, Elohim worshipping, prostitute who have had lots of mixed DNA in her by a confession in the lineage of Christ. Deliberately mentioned. The lineage of Christ in Matthew is four, four women mentioned in that, but doesn't mention Sarah or Rebecca. It doesn't mention famous women. It mentions only four women, and for good reason. Rahab's one. Bathsheba's another. It's restoring them. It's giving the honour that, that was taken from them. Okay. Can we bring up uh, Numbers 14, 10 to 20? Okay. So this is the Israelites. They're grumbling against Moses. Okay. They're very angry with him. 
This happened a few times. <laughs> then all the congregation said to stone them with stones. That's Moses and Joshua. But the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of the meeting to the people of Israel. Remember, the glory is a body. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will this people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me? What's God's love language? To be believed. To believe the word. If you believe the word, it's counted to you as righteousness. Rahab is righteous forever. She is recorded forever. The prostitute that uh, wept and washed her feet and uh, broke the jar, she is recorded forever. And the Bible says she will be recorded forever. <laughs> they received a word. Okay? And he's saying, why won't they love me for who I am? I've given them a word. Just believe my word. They're saying, we're going to die in the desert. But God said, I'm, I brought you here. I'm a loving father. Okay? And they're saying, you are not a loving father. That's what they're saying. So what do they want to do? Kill Moses. So what father are they showing at the moment? Yeah. All right. So, and the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people despise me? How long will they not believe in me? In spite of all the signs I have done among them, I will strike them with pestilence and disinherit them, and I will make you a nation and mightier than they. Okay, he's talking to Moses. Abraham, these are Abraham's kids. They've got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. They've done it again. He does this twice. And Moses, he says to Moses, I'm starting again with you because you believe my word. The whole Israel, sons of Abraham, gone. It's now going to be the sons of Moses. And Moses, it's not Isaac and the 12 tribes, over. Moses will have a kid, they'll have a third kid, that third kid will have 12 kids. That's what I'm going to do. I'm staying again with you, Moses. Big offer, yeah? That's a big offer. Look at Moses' response. This is very important. Uh, and you will see this over again from now on. But Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear of it, for you brought up this people in your might from among them, and they will tell you the inhabitants of this land, and they will tell the inhabitants of this land. They have heard that you, O Lord, are in the midst of the people, for you, O Lord, are seen to face are seen face to face, and your cloud stands over them, and you go before them in a pillar of cloud and by day and a pillar of fire by night. Now, if you kill these people as one man, then the nations who have heard of your fame will say, it is because of the Lord was not able to bring these people into the land that he swore to give them that they were killed in the wilderness. What is it? It's a divine counsel. He's saying, if you kill us, the other Elohim and their people will say, the Lord Almighty cannot do what he says. He's having a pretty thorough argument with God. Remember the other, when Daniel 9, the Elohim was said to God, don't you see, you see everything, and yet you permit this. That's brave, yeah? But it's a family. This is a family, okay? Moses is talking very directly to God. If you wipe out these people, the other Elohim, the other people will say, Lord Most High, I can't do it. And now please let the power of the Lord be great as you have promised, saying... The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. What seed line is speaking now? Yep. Forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he will, by, he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting iniquity on the fathers of the children to the third and fourth generation. Please pardon the iniquity of these people according to the greatness of your steadfast love, just as you've forgiven this people from Egypt until now. He's making a call. On God's character. Hang on, this is who you are. That's what David does after Bathsheba. Remember your great love. It's about you. It says, about, this is about your name. You must forgive me. It's about your name, about who you are. Making a call. You can do that. It's amazing, yeah? I don't know if it comes up later. So... Uh, God invites everyone up the mountain for the ketubah, for a marriage. Yep. And then, oh, it does come up later. 
They'd gone for such a long time that they build something. That's the, that's the model. That's Adam and Eve. It's not happening now. So they reach for taste, touch, and see. They saw no form, it says, invisible, and so they reach for something. And instantly it goes to uh, <laughs> it goes downhill very quickly. Yep. And God's angry. And he says, I'm wiping these guys out. I'm going to start again with you, Moses. And Moses says, save them and write me out. He pleads on behalf of the guilty. What's he doing? He's, he knows who the father really is. He's making a call on the father. Yep. He's just been offered again the kingdom. And he says, no, actually write me out. That these people be saved. Yep. Which is what we know the Messiah does. Okay. And then from there, it goes on. <laughs> on and on they go. Gideon, uh, Samson. I don't know what I did with my uh, Samson stuff. That was actually very important, but I've clearly lost it. <laughs> okay. Samson, which I think is Judges 6 or something. Just have a look. In the opening of Samson, is it Judges 6? People know. It says, remember Samson, and he's such a naughty guy, and he's sleeping around and doing these crazy things. And Okay. What does it say about Samson? God says he did this to pick a fight. Yeah. Yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> I've obviously lost some notes. It's okay. They're in here. In here. He's doing it to pick a fight. He wants to pick a fight. Gideon, he wants to pick a fight. And he chooses someone who's hiding and with a word says, no, you are a mighty man. Will Gideon receive that word? And they've got too many people. They're not too much flesh must be on the word. Everyone's scared, go home. Brave people there. No, still too many. Send those guys home. Yeah, must be on the word and a promise. So Samson, oh, hang, come on. 16, so close. Let's see if this is the right one. Samson went to Gaza and there he saw a prostitute and he went into her. That's pretty literal. <laughs> the Gazites were told. <laughs> Samson has come here. And they surrounded the place. Greg, stop it. <laughs> and they surrounded the place and set an ambush for him all night at the gate of the city. They kept quiet all night saying, let us wait till the light of the morning, then we will kill him. But Samson lay till midnight, and at midnight he arose and took hold of the doors of the gate of the city. Very important, he took the gates, okay? That will come up again in, with Jesus. And two posts, and he pulled them up, bar and all, and put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that is in front of Hebron. Okay. Okay. What's, what's uh, 15? Um, up. Oh, sorry, what's chapter 15? In my, in my mind, it was in the first few verses. Here we go. Let's see this one. At the time of the wheat harvest, Samson went in to visit his wife with a young goat. He said, I'll go to my wife in the chamber, but her father would not allow him to go in. Let's see. And the father said, I really thought that you hardly hated her, so I gave her to your companion. Let's go to 14. Just full of sex and violence. Okay, here we go. This is what we wanted. Samson went down to Timrah, and at Timrah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Oh, again. Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah, and now get her for me as a wife. But his father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among our people that you, that you must go and take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? Okay. This is, he's taking a foreign wife, foreign trading. This is a bad idea. But Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. Samson was a 
guttural guy. He was full of he went off the moment, yeah? His father and mother did not know that this was from the Lord, for he, the Lord, was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. Because at that time the Philistines ruled over Israel. This guy, very passionate, very spontaneous, saw a woman from another place and said, Get her for me as a wife. What's God doing? He's picking a fight. Yeah. Yeah. That's we'll just end off the uh, Old Testament this way. Um, we see that uh, oh, here we go. Can we put up uh, Joshua nine. I'll, I'll tell you about it. In Joshua nine, he's taking out all the giants and their lands. These people come to him, and they're dressed in old rags, and their shoes are worn out. And they say, "We're from a long way away, okay? Please have a truce with us." And I look at them, see them from a long way away. They said, "We've heard you've defeated the other gods, the other Elohim. We know you can beat us because your God's stronger than our God, which is true." And they said, "Okay, we have a truce. We have a truce against these people." And then they found out they didn't live a long way away. They lived close by. So they couldn't wipe them out. And so a people of mixed race, another Elohim, was now inside Israel's territory. No truces. Okay? In, uh, and these people come back again. These are the Gibeonites. And then you see all the problems they cause later on. You see this person, this person, he causes trouble for Israel. You trace him back, he's a Gibeonite, like generations later. Uh, in 1 Samuel 15, Saul, the king Saul, God said, go and wipe out the Amalekites, Wipe out everything which is theirs. Wipe out their cattle. Wipe out their livestock. Wipe out every person. Yep. And then the Samuel the prophet comes and Saul's there and there's cattle around and there's still people there. He says, what have you done? I told you to wipe everything out. Now the kingdom's going to be taken from you. It was that serious. Because a judgment had been made in the divine council. I said, Saul, go do it. And he didn't do it. And then we see later on that David has to fight the Amicalites. Yeah. Then later, Saul actually takes out the Gibeonites. Though. In the Gibeonites that, that Joshua made a truce with, that's their word. They're God's people. You must keep your word. Saul kills the Gibeonites. In David's reign, things start going badly. He finds out why. Because Saul, hundreds of years later, broke the truth. And David has to repay that truth, repay that broken uh, um, vow. It's amazing, yeah? And then you've got David, then you've got Solomon, and Solomon gives himself to idols. Yep. And what's he doing? He's actually trading. Solomon wanted more, more and more. He wasn't happy with what God gave him. He wanted the power, he wanted to understand the stars, he wanted to do a lot of trading. Yep. And uh, you don't hear much about Solomon uh, these days. <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, I don't know what to say about that. People go to the cloud. What do you see? I saw David. I saw this. I see that. I know he's never mentioned. It's just interesting. And the kingdom splits. Okay? And the top ten tribes become Israel. The bottom two tribes become uh, Judea. Because they're the Jews and Benjamin. Okay? So you've got ten and twelve. Now they're split. And the top ten tribes uh, really give themselves to the idols. Over and over again. And all the prophets are going, don't do this, don't do this. God still loves them. And finally... They're removed. The top ten tribes are removed. A better comes from the north, away from the north. They get taken north. What's north? Giants. That's hell is north. Baal is north. Mixed seed is north. Yep. What is going on? Yep. And then, so the northern kingdom goes, and then what happens? The southern kingdom do the same thing. Idols. Eventually they get taken into Babylon. Where? Under the head Elohim of that time. Yep. And you've got Daniel and the Prince of Persia fights in the Elohim and the 
Watcha comes in, okay? So you can see the whole battle, the whole way through, is this issue. So what's God going to do about this? What can we possibly do? Well, the good news. Before the foundation, blood was shed. Before the foundation, the lamb was slain. And that blood, that blood speaks a better word than Abel, as well as the blood shed in this era. All the sin, all the crimes, no matter how bad they are, no matter how horrendous they are to our minds, and they are, and more so to God, the blood before the foundation of the world was shed. We see for God to fix up these five, he starts with a promise of faith and a child of faith, like a new line. But the only way to really fix it up, because that didn't do the whole job, the only way to really fix it up is to bring in a new line of sons. So God sent his own son, the son of the Most High, with a new genetic line. He's different. He is a son of God. He's the son of God. The word became flesh and was his son. I'm going to read something to you. Because we all know the term only begotten. The only begotten son of God. What is going on? Yesterday, everyone's technology went off. Did you notice that? We're talking about DNA trading and technology kept going off. The doll, the phones, the things. The doll, yeah. Okay. That word only begotten, we got that from the King James. And because it's monogenes, okay? And we thought genes was genetic, like genetic lines. But now we know more about Greek. We know it's not that at all. <laughs> In the Greek-English lexicon, BDAG, defines monogenes as something that is the only example in its category. That's what it means. He's the only type. He's a one of a kind. He's not these ben Elohim. He's a new one, a different one. There's nothing like him. So I'm just going to read straight from um, Michael Heiss's book. If you ever want to go deep into this stuff, a guy called Michael Heiser. I've actually been very careful not to mention people because I believe them. But I'm not sure they believe me. <laughs> and so I always give honour to people. And uh, this was first introduced, introduced to me in about 2008. And I was sitting with my friend Daniel in Adelaide and we're watching this guy preach. We're sitting there like, what? <laughs> like, this is either the worst or greatest sermon I've ever heard. We, were, we just couldn't believe what we were hearing. Yep. And so, and then obviously, there's lots of people who you know, who I've encountered over that time, who've expanded on this and have encountered these types of things. And I always love to give honour where we've learnt from. But because I'm teaching on this, uh, I just want to <laughs> put a teaching out. I'm trying not to associate other people with this teaching until it's maybe been through... Um, Peer review. <laughs> I'm sure it will. Yeah. But uh, a guy called Michael Heiser, I just uh, I haven't read his books, but I've heard some of his stuff and it's, it's amazing. He's very accessible and very conservative. Okay. Uh, I don't even think he is um, charismatic or anything, but his understanding of this and his surety of it is exceptional. Dr. Michael Heiser. This is from his book, The Unseen Realm, which I haven't read, <laughs> but it would be amazing because I've heard him being interviewed before. Monogenes, monogenes, doesn't mean only begotten in some sort of birthing sense. The confusion extends from an old misunderstanding of the root of the Greek word. For years, monogenes, monogenes, 
was thought to have been derived from two Greek terms, mono, only, and geneo, to beget, to bear. Greek scholars later discovered that the second part of the word monogenes does not come from the Greek verb geneo, to beget, but rather from the noun genos, which means a class or kind. The term literally means one of a kind, or unique, without connotation of created origin. Jesus is the unique son of God, the one of a kind. That's what he is. And then that seed, the same seed, of being a one of a kind son of God is given to us. We are the beloved son, a new race born from above, who are like our father. <laughs> Slow to anger, great in mercy, pray for enemies, lay our life down on behalf of the guilty. Hebrews 11, 17 to 9. Oh, so hang on, 17 to 19. <laughs> yeah. All right. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, whom he had received the promise and was in the act of offering up his only son. Okay? That's the same term. Of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able to even raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Anyway, the point being is, only son. You can see how the pattern is continued. Can we bring up 1 John 15, 18? If you ever want to really see the whole seed line stuff, John gets into it. It's at the forefront of his mind in his Gospels and in his letters. Oh, um, oh 5, 18. <laughs> Numbers today. 1 John 5, 18. My apologies. Okay. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who is born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. Okay? You've got a perfect seed in you. But this is what needs to be taught. Your true self is not sinning. Do you think your spirit man is coveting your neighbor's wife? Do you think your spirit man that's made of the same seed of Jesus Christ, of the Father, of Yahweh, looks exactly like him, is stealing? Gossiping, defending themselves. That seed on the night he was betrayed gave up his body. That seed said, forgive them, Father, and don't know what they do. Because he was like his Father in heaven. That's who you are. If that's who you are, this is very important for the next little four months. I don't think how that goes, maybe four years. Well, I'm not saying four years in an in a election cycle. I'm just saying as a time. Five years then. God protects him, and the evil one doesn't touch him. I can make it sound more impressive. In the King James, it says the devil touches him not. Wow. So what's all your spiritual warfare about? Are you born again? Can the devil touch the risen Christ? He can't do it to Christ. He can't do it to you. He knows. God knows. There's only one question. You know. This is the gospel. Can we go to John 14.30? John 14.30? 30. This is Jesus. I will no longer talk much with you. The ruler of this world, or the prince of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. The prince is coming. The Elohim, this guy, is coming in. He has no claim on me. There's nothing in common. The sound in this, wah, has no agreement with that sound. Wah, okay? Jesus is like, ah, 
The devil's like, Wah. okay? There's nothing. There's no agreement. He has nothing in common. Jesus could walk through the crowds. They wanted death. He had nothing in common. Okay? But if Jesus was revenge-filled, there's something in common. They have a leverage on him. Okay? So when you're watching the TV, you want to punish those people, you're operating on the same trading flat platform as they are. Just on the di- different side of the knowledge of good and evil. They're evil. I'm good. But the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world to lay down his life on behalf of the guilty. God said to Abraham and to Moses, I'm going to start again with you. He said, I'd rather be written in the book of life that the Hebrews be saved. That's the Father's heart. Moses, uh, Abraham pleaded on behalf of the guilty at uh, Solomon Gomorrah. Enoch pleaded on behalf of the guilty. Jesus pleaded on behalf of the guilty. Paul in Romans, Romans, Romans 5 says, Arise written in the book of life that Hebrews be saved. That's the Father's heart. Yep. And we'll see later. Stephen. Okay. We're doing very well. So, there is a New Testament counterpart to everything in Genesis 1 to 11. Because that is what it's doing. That's what it's doing. So, I'm just going to go through these things. I'll read them out to you. We'll go through these falls. Okay. And all those stories, if you go through the Bible, you could go, you could just start ticking things off. So you go, Moses, this story, you go, oh, that one and that one. And then Abraham gets a promise, okay? That's uh, that one and that one. All right? And then you go through all the stories of into Egypt and go, oh right, that's uh, that one, <laughs> you know. And then you get to Jesus and it's like, ah, oh, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. He does it all. Yep. Let's have a quick look at what Jesus did here for us all. So the first fall, Satan. Can you remember Lion, the Witch, in the Wardrobe? Yeah. And they shaved Aslan. I put him on the table. And they killed him. And the table cracks. <laughs> he comes back. They're like, how can this be? I saw you killed. You know, by magic. And then it says, no, there's the former magic. For the before the before, a deeper magic, the earlier magic. That is what happened to Satan. He thought he killed Jesus at the cross. But they knew what they were doing when they slew the Lord of glory. They wouldn't have done it. So, Jesus' death of that Son of God, uh, that fixes up the, the, the behavior of the Son of God who became Hasatan, Satan. Okay? So, they all have free will. Satan uses his free will to rebel against God. What does Jesus do with his free will? He says, not my will, but yours. Yep. Basically quotes his mum. Yep. The devil says, I will ascend and sit on your throne. Jesus comes off his throne, comes here, doesn't see equality with God, something to be grasped, stoops down, makes us great, and gives us freely, by his work, a place on his throne. Satan wanted to reach, get it with his own hands. Jesus did it for us and gives it to us as a gift. Satan brings in death. Genesis 3 is not about sin. It's about will you surely die? Yep. And so we become mortal. So what has Jesus done for us? Given the gospel of immortality, we will live forever, starting now. What about the devil? He's like, you are a bad father. <laughs> and Jesus came and revealed the good father. Yeah. So the, the devil has created a fallen DNA race of people that resent God 
uh, with uh, mixed DNA. Okay? And now they're estranged. Jesus comes back at the cross. He does two things. He says, we're adopted back into the family. And also he says, and you're born again. That's why the only way to see the kingdom is to be born again. Only his son see the kingdom. That pure line. And it's given to us as a free gift. The cross and the lamb slain before foundation undoes everything done in this. If you know that, you're free from it. Yep. Adam and Eve. What did they say? What did the devil say? Did God really say? And they believe that, yeah. God, did God really say? That's the, that's the test on first Adam. Last Adam, Jesus. The devil questions him. Are you the son of God? Didn't God, didn't God say, this, give you this promise? And does Jesus reach with his own hand to prove something? He just says, it is written. So, Jesus is destroying Adam, which is the cosmic crime, in the same way that Mary restores Eve. Yep. This is important. In the Garden of Eden, the food was beautiful to look at and useful to eat. Because if, if they didn't eat, would they die? No. Okay? So it's for pleasure. It's beautiful to look at and it's useful to eat. The devil shows them the tree and they saw it was useful to eat and pleasurable. It became a source. Okay? And that's how we see food. This is useful and also tasty. But I need to eat or I'll die. <laughs> okay? Jesus reverses this. He gives us Communion. He gave up his own body. He's that fruit. He's the seed that goes to the ground. Because the fruit, the fruit knowledge of good and evil has seed in it. That's the point. A different word to come in. And he's giving us a better word. He's giving us his own body. When you take communion, it's spirit, soul, body. Okay? Because in your hand you've got something, in your heart you believe. But to go the right way down, you step into heaven, let's say, let's say you step into heaven. With Jesus, you literally are taking in the body and the blood of Jesus. Literally. But it's not transubstantiation as in the way the Catholics believe, that in their hand they believe they've got flesh and blood in their hand. In the spirit, you're taking in the body of Jesus Christ. Now we know that everything was made from the word. We know that God framed the world by his word, who is Christ. Everything's made through him and for him and by him. So everything's word. So calcium is made up of word. Hormones, protein, molecular structure is made up of word. When you take of Jesus, it's anything that you call it with your intention. This is magnesium. This is enough food for breakfast. This is enough food for a day. And as you can believe that, you have to slowly move your soul across, okay? And your soul will freak out and grieve losses. And lots of the emotions that food's been suppressing in your life will come to the top. <laughs> and you want to go into knowledge of good and evil and you want to do all these things. And it's fascinating once you take food away as a source because that. You're using food as a source to suppress emotions, even boredom. Yep. It's a source. That source, there's no life in that source. There's only death in that source. Okay? Because remember, organic avocado doesn't give you life. Organic avocado is saying, son of man, son of God, give me life. We're supposed to call it life. Okay? So it's pleasure and useful but not necessary. Because Jesus is our source. So you take that in. This is enough food for uh, a day or a week <laughs> or a year <laughs> or lunch or this is magnesium or this is blood thinner, whatever you want it to be. Okay, It's coming from outside creation. 
So it has no corruption, no lack, no loss, no waste product, no 100% efficiency. You bring in word, you believe in your heart, that's waveform, word form, believe it, emotions, waveform, enjoy it, it hits your body, particle, collapsed. You become substance. You have incarnated the word. Yeah. <laughs> Put a demand on the word. And it's the opposite of everything you've been taught. Taste, touch, and see. Communion is spiritual genius. <laughs> Always intention before the beginning of the world. We can live by the word. Here's a cool one. But Adam and Eve, Adam gets kicked out. And now you must work by the sweat of your brow against the thorns and the thistles for your provision. First Adam. What did second Adam or last Adam do? He had thorns and thistles put into his brow. He did the work for us. Now, did Adam and Eve have to work? Yeah. They worked to tend provision. To make it in their image. To shape the natural provision of Eden, the Garden of Eden. Then you're out, have to work for it. And now, they're being restored back to Eden by the by second Adam, thorns and thistles. You can go back in now into that promise. So you don't have to work for provision ever again in your life. But you do work from provision. And from provision, you may work, you know, 12 hour days, depending on what you're doing. <laughs> you know? So to frame that up, let's say I am a um, photocopier salesman working on the telephones. Christian, I don't understand this. I do my tithe, do my trade, need God to come and help me. And then I get on the phones, I do my stats, I make my 200 calls and buy statistics. I get two sales every 200 calls. Something like that. Yep, I'm working for it. I'm working, but I sweat my brow. Or I'm a son in the garden. The king is providing. And that this sales job is where God has this son for a reason. He will provide for me in this area. Perhaps I'm there for one person. Perhaps I'm there for the supervisor. I don't know why I'm there. Perhaps I'm there I'm going to get a phone call with someone. I'm just obeying the voice of God. And today... I'm a salesman for photocopiers. When I'm on the phone, it's not work. All I'm doing is finding the sale that God's put aside for me. The difference is between fight or flight, beta state, or rest, theta state. Rest and digest, or fight or flight. The knowledge you have a good father, and he's in provision for you. In your business, or the desire of your heart. Would you risk doing the desire of your heart? Would the kingdom provide for you there? Would he? <laughs> Work well, swab your brow. Fixed up. Everything's fixed up. Okay. Adam and Eve. Adam, kicked out. It's the woman you put me here with. Yep. Eve, it's the snake you put in the garden. It's your fault. Jesus takes personal responsibility for things he never did. That's what we do. So we, there's lots of teachings on the courts of heaven. Yeah? Doing lots of courts of heaven stuff. Okay? I don't know what it's done for America because <laughs> it's getting worse. <laughs> yep. But that's okay. I'm not, I, they're, they're real. 100% real. I 100% believe in the courts. I really do. But we're going to courts to get judgments by the knowledge of good and evil. I'm not going there and pleading that Lord would forgive Nancy Pelosi. I'm going there that God will take those people out. That's what we're doing. So we're going into this court that, no, one of these courts, probably not this one, but another court, with a father whose blood 
He grew with his son to lay down blood before the foundation of the world. And with a great cost, his son incarnated and did it again in this time space so heaven could come here. That God wished all could be saved. Good news to the whole world. Not holding men's sin against them. And to make people in that image that will do the same thing. We're going up to heaven and asking God to take people out. By our knowledge of good and evil. Yep. But Jesus took responsibility for sins he didn't commit. That's us. If, if Dwight deeply betrays me and tells secrets of mine and it really damages me and it really hurts me, okay, and it cost me my ministry and maybe put some lies in there too and now it's on YouTube and now I'm done, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if, if you did that, and it's really hurt me. I am hurt. It is devastating. I want justice. This is not right. And now I'm getting kicked out of the country, and everything's gone wrong. I'm leaving my parents' basement <laughs> with a CB radio, <laughs> playing Dungeons and Dragons. That's actually Dwight's dream life. <laughs> but let's say everything I've ever built up has been taken from me. And also, there's lies about me, I can't get rid of them. And it's deeply damaged my ability, and it's really hurt me, and I've lost friends over it, and it's very painful. I need justice. I need justice. So go on to heaven, but Jesus is my advocate. And this is how I use the courts. Father, I want to say that me... And my generations, if not me personally, this DNA I'm carrying, we have lied about people, we've hurt people, and we destroy them. We have done it. I have done it. I'm taking responsibility. Okay? And I say, and it's true, and it's in my DNA. I say, Lord, would you forgive me and cleanse me of this by the blood of the Lamb? He says, Yes, you're clean. I just got off for free. Of a terrible crime. I say, Father, I just got for free from a terrible crime. I ask now you'd set Dwight free as well. I remove all charges from him. I ask that you love him. I ask you protect him. I ask that his sins will be hidden, that he'll be covered. Nobody knows. And the area of damage that he operated from, that love would find the area and he'd be restored. Yeah. That's what Jesus did. There's a difference between guilty and responsibility, okay? So if I get drunk and I fall down the stairs and I break my arm, it's my fault. I have to go to the doctor, get an x-ray, get a cast, do a sh have showers like this, you know? I have to do that. It's my fault. It's my responsibility. If Dwight gets drunk and pushes me down the stairs and I break my arm, it's his fault. That's still my responsibility. I've got to look after this arm. Dwight's not sharing me. Okay? I've got to share myself. <laughs> it doesn't matter how it happened. God's saying you can take responsibility in your heart before him. And on earth, forgiveness is not saying it was okay. Okay? Forgiveness is given, but trust is earned. So it doesn't mean you let damaging people back into your life. That means the charge you have against them between you and God, you take it to heaven. You may have to do it three or four times. That's okay. Forgiveness is a big deal to Jesus. That's the Father. That is his heart. To restore you, to wipe your sins clean. Let's reason together. Let your sins be as scarlet, I'll make you white as snow. Remember your sins no more, the promise of the new covenant. So that's what we do. We forgive the big debt by the king. You know the story? doesn't hold a small debt against someone else. And that's very hard to process. But forgiveness is. It's a miracle, actually. Yeah. It's a new nature. Okay. Am I Eve out the garden? And there's a cherubim there. Two cherubim with a flaming sword. Can't get back in. Okay. So what does Jesus do? Where's the cherubim? On the temple veil. Two cherubim, we can't go back, men can't go back, 
and he, the, the temple veils tore from top to bottom. What God's saying, you're welcome back. You can get back into Eden. Yeah. Undoes everything. Yeah, we've gone from knowing him by the law to knowing him by the Holy Spirit. And replace that seed line. Any damage, any record in you of uh, the enemy and being like that, taking communion changes it. Yeah. All right. All right. The watchers. God deals with the watchers. The changed DNA. You're born again. And you can apply it with the communion. But also, in obeying the Spirit, you mortify the flesh. Are you by the Holy Spirit? It changes your DNA. As soon as you've chosen to forgive, that record on you changes. And the devil come back again to try and get you to be angry at someone. But it's gone. Oh, there's no nothing in common. Yep. It's gone from your DNA, from your field. Okay. Ah, we'll see this when we see uh, Jesus picks a fight. The Elohim and the land, okay, they've all got their Elohim, had their land we saw. Um, in Jeremiah 32, Elohim get their land, they're fallen, but God's over a certain land, okay. Jesus goes into Israel, sorts that out, that's God's land, okay. I'm going to tear this temple, all right, I'm here, I'm the son of God. Then he goes north, because who's north? Dan, Ephraim, Canaanites, Bashan, Mount Hermon. And you see, We'll bring up a map, maybe, uh, I'll do it now. There's a map there that, about Jesus, it's called the Jesus map or something. Yep. And Jesus ministers all around the Sea of Galilee and around there. And then he goes right at the top, and he goes right down the bottom. Okay, I'll read it to you. <laughs> you see Jesus is very busy around the Sea of Galilee, all those things come up the Galilee. And then right up the top, up there, there's Mount Hermon. And that's where Jesus and talks to Peter, and Peter says, "You are the Messiah." Yep. You are the the Messiah, the Son of the Most High. He's been declared that where in Caesarea Philippi, in front of Mount Hermon, where this all started. Amazing, yeah. Absolutely incredible. And then Peter says, "But don't lay down your life." And Jesus says, "Get behind me, Satan." What's behind the Mount Hermon? What's the Mount Hermon? The gates of hell. That's what it's called. Temple of Baal, Temple of Zeus, Temple of Pan. If you bring up that picture, it might say, I don't know, you'll find it. <laughs> that one there. There it is. That's it. Right there. That's the one. That's the one. That's the gates of hell. And when he makes a confession, he says, the gates of hell yeah, shall not prevail, or, or hopefully a better understanding is shall not withstand you, because we're picking the fight. The gates of hell will not withstand you; they're right there. If you bring up that that uh, that it's called screenshot. <laughs> That's it. This is from 2018. They did, some, they did some work around the area. They found that the Israelites in biblical Dan worshipped idols. Fancy that. It's exactly what the Bible says. And Yahweh, okay, mixed, gone. Changed their DNA so much, they're no longer Israelites. Yeah. Okay. Let's look up 1 Peter 3, 19 to 20. These next two couple of verses are very controversial. At least I got the right verse. That's good. In which he, Jesus, went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. So Jesus has gone to prison and proclaimed something, this is what Aaron argues about, to the spirits that died in the time of Noah. So this isn't Old Testament fairy tales. This is Peter talking about it now in the epistles. What did Jesus do? Fix this up. 
okay? Now, many people say proclaim, it's called herald. They went there and declared the final victory. He wasn't doing an outreach service to the Nephilim, okay? <laughs> it's heralded, declared. This is the triumphant war when the king comes back into town. We won against the so-and-so, yep. Because they formally did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. That's who Jesus is preaching to, to the spirits in prison. While the ark was being prepared, Noah. Just in case you, got, you didn't know what this was on about. The people, the Nephilim, the giants that got wiped out with Noah. In which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formally did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. While the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Okay. Can you bring up Ephesians 4, 8, Ephesians 4, 8 to 10? So I've spent three days telling you this terrible news. You've been very good, very patient. And this is all good news from here. We're just seeing that, not only is it all that true, and I just went through and we showed how you can't see it without it. We see that the gospel and the epistles, and want to read the early church fathers as well, all dealt with this issue. Okay, Ephesians 4, 8 to 10. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives. Who were they? These spirits that he spoke to. He went down to Sheol. This is what happened in, in the days of those war. They go, they defeat a land, they take captives back, and they give gifts of what they of what they uh, won in the war. This is what's happening. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? Where are the titans? <laughs> Where are these people held in captivity? He went down to them and proclaimed what the, the war was over. It is finished. He who has descended is also the one who has also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fit all things. Fixed. It's come to an end. These guys dealt with some other, and now they have to wait, they have to wait to the final judgment. They're waiting it out now. Not a good time for them. Okay. Trading in idolatry. Lots of hovering over and engaging with beings. People still do that today. And they want your DNA. All witchcraft is exchanging future generations for current benefit. It's a control mechanism. Yep. So you have to give some of your DNA, either by a vow. I will join the Freemasons and curse my kids to get a business deal. Yep. My friend grew up in a country town in South Australia, and her grandfather would not join the Masons. The Freemasons ran these small towns. And so you couldn't get into business. So they were always poor. Couldn't get a court case. Couldn't get anything. Okay? So you can't buy, sell, or trade. It's the same system. Yep. And the grandma was very angry with him because they couldn't go to the local dances. They couldn't do anything. If you didn't become a Freemason, you are out. Yep. But his children and his grandchildren were all, Christ all became great Christians. Why? He didn't trade them in, he didn't curse them. Yeah, didn't you know? Say blindfold himself, so we'll be blind, we'll be deaf, those type of things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what am I talking about? <laughs> what are we all doing here? This is madness. <laughs> yeah, mixed nations. What have we got here? Oh, so trading and idolatry. And um, the gospel goes out to all the nations. Okay, so send everything out. This is interesting. So we know that the Gentiles, including Dan and Ephraim now, okay, this is, they're the Gentiles. Now God wants everything restored, and there's a problem. The Gentiles are behaving like another father and don't like God. So what are we in now? The time of the Gentiles. This is the time God's fixing up all those nations wherever they spread. 
He's fixing him up. That's what he's doing right now. That's the time of the Gentiles. When that number is full, it's over. And so, <laughs> unclean spirits and their friends don't want the number of the Gentiles to come in. That's the effort against us. That's the effort in your country at this moment. Okay. Peter has a vision. Food comes down. All food's now clean. Okay. Don't call unclean what I call clean. What's God saying? The Gentiles. What does he do next? He goes to Cornelius' house and he and his whole household are saved. And Cornelius cried out, not to Lord Most High, but been to his God. But God saw his heart and cleans his house. Comes under another covering, clean. David's mighty men could do crazy stuff. Why? Because they were of that line. They were Nephilim, maybe Eliud. They were dimensional. They had some stuff on them. Okay? David goes around and kills those guys. But these guys joined him. They come under David's covering, under his frequency, under his sound. They call the Lord God Most High. They receive that word that Lord God is the Most High God. And now they're Israelites. They're under the covenant. Nephilim crew. Now Hebrews. <laughs> now Israelites. And Dan did the opposite. These guys left their idols and joined the Lord Most High. Amazing, yeah? Communion obviously fixes this up. Can you pull up John 6, 51 to 70? This is worth reading. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. All right. Remember, this is what we're addressing. This is what Jesus is addressing. Okay. So you come from heaven. No corruption. Okay. I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. What could that possibly mean? And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. What? Cannibalism? What did the giants do? Eat people. What's he undoing? He's undoing the effect of eating people. It's cannibalism. It's lichenism, if you want to go deep into that. All right. Don't. <laughs> Just interesting. The Jews then disputed amongst themselves, saying, How can this man give us flesh to eat? Okay? Banned. Leviticus. <laughs> so Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Because the other father is the father of death. This is the only way you can get life. It has to come from somewhere else. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood, what a crazy verse, has eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood, he really is pushing this point, abides in me and I in him. And the living Father sent me. The living Father. God is Father. He's making a point. A new line. God's a loving Father. He always has been. Elohim of Elohim. And I live because of the Father. So whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Okay? He's talking about natural death. He's like, oh, yeah, accept Jesus. Yeah, I'll die again and I'll see him in heaven. He's saying, your fathers ate natural bread and, that, and really died. If you eat of me, you won't really die. The offer's there. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue he taught at Capernaum. When many of the disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying, who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, <laughs> said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? What's he saying? I'm from heaven. Okay? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. 
the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, the opposite of Satan. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were that did not believe and it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it's granted by the Father. After this, many disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. John 6, 6, 6. They wouldn't accept a new seed line. They wouldn't accept you have to receive from heaven, have of him. It must come from Christ, what he has done. John 6, 66. After this, many disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Your words are eternal life. You know, live off the word. He is faithful and true, and he will save me. And if he doesn't, he's still faithful and true. Into your hands I commit my spirit. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Okay? And Jesus answered them, Do I not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? Is a devil. Was Judas literally a devil? Was he the disembodied spirit of a Nephilim? No, no. That's the nature he's expressing of the Father. Yeah. Okay. Trading. Lots of adultery involved in trading. Okay. And people, idolatry, as we saw before, is adultery. Idolatry is, uh, is adultery. Another lover. On every hill you've laid yourself barren. Didn't I woo you? And you've gone and pursued other, other people. And when you read that, God is cut. He's not holding back. He's very vulnerable. He's furiously angry. And he's, he, he's trying to work out. He's saying, and every other God, he calls him another lover. Yep. So what have we got? A husband. We have a faithful husband that will never leave us. Jesus Christ. Yeah. When the law was given, I'll see this, maybe see this later, what happened when they went to idolatry and the, they went to the golden calves and then Moses comes down and they've all given themselves to idols? The Levites strap on swords and they go and kill people. How many die through the idolatry? 3,000 die. Acts 2, we'll see in a minute, fixes up Babel. Peter gets up and preaches. How many people get saved? 3,000. Everything is undone. Okay? Babel. In Genesis 10, there's 70 nations in Genesis 10, and they get split out with their gods. Or does, who does, how many people does Jesus send out? 70. Yep. Genesis 11, languages are messed up. What happens in Acts 2? Tongues. Boom. Look at that. Right on time. Very good. Okay. Genesis, the problem is Genesis 1 to 11. Everyone believes it all the way through. Peter's writing about it. Literally writing about it. Not like, oh, you can see that's all about the giants. Literally talking about Noah, spirits. Paul saying the law was given at this time. John quotes the book of Enoch Lots, the concepts he's talking about, being thrown to the lake of fire, prepared for the devils and his angels. It's all there. Genesis 1 to 11 is the problem. And then Genesis, the rest of Genesis 12. So Genesis 12 is the halfway point in the Bible up until now is the answer. And now God wants these sons of God to go fix it up. How? By strapping on swords and killing people? No. To come like our Father in heaven who says, reign on the good and evil, the just and the unjust. That's your true nature. That is overcoming. And for those who overcome, we are to sit on his throne. Yeah. Not all Christians will sit on that throne. For those who overcome. Not those people born with great DNA and die of that great, that great DNA. <laughs> We're comparing ourselves against other Christians. The only person you can compare yourself to in the scriptures 
is the risen Christ. And that's what he's given to you. Can you take that land? Yes, you can. Yeah. Jesus, you are the Lord Most High. You are the Lord Most High. We love you. We honor you. And you have given your very self to us. You are our righteousness. You are our holiness. It's no longer I live. It's Christ that lives in me. You've joined us together. We are one. Whatever we do, you do. And you love us. You sing songs over us. And you want us to be exactly like you. And Lord, we know that this was your idea. So we rest. We rest. We are the beloved Son of God. We're the object of your affection. The only way we can prove for the object of your affection is to be still and watch you move. From here, the fruit of the Spirit come. There will be a people, mature sons, and I declare a great future for this nation and the world. As sons rise up to a glorified body and redeem the earth. Amen. Very good.